Well, my name is Sandy Clark. Welcome to, um, you know, I should say into the microphone, but you probably can't see me over the podium. Um, I'm also known as Mouse. Um, welcome to ShmooCon. Um, I'd like to, to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, a year ago or so, because of our work in um, wiretapping and in privacy, um, we published a paper discussing the sort of issues that we thought that, that policymakers, attorneys and politicians ought to understand about um, technology and privacy. And it was requested that we write a law review paper, that we write a paper for attorneys that would teach them how, uh, the things that they needed to know. Um, I have never been so confused in my life. The details, the type of information, the way that information is, is portrayed and, and explained is completely different than the hacker world or the academic world that I'm used to. So it's absolutely essential if we are going to get people to understand the technological aspects that affect security, that affect privacy, that affect um, um, networking or um, or systems or anything that, that we play with or touch, um, we are going to have to be the people that educate the policy makers. So I'm really thrilled to see you out here, here this morning because this is stuff that we don't know how to do. It's, it's absolutely a foreign country to us and we need to understand more about it. And so that's why I'm thrilled that, that um, Shannon is here. Shannon is unique in our world because he's a programmer. He spent 30 years as a coder and then decided to become an attorney. Um, and we today are really lucky to be able to benefit from his expertise. So let me introduce Shannon Brown. Thank you. Oh. Okay, okay. We'll uh, tell jokes at this point, whatever we need to do. Uh, thank you for the introduction, by the way. You know, I'm hoping today, I mean, this is all pre-network uh, uh, stuff and things like that. I'm hoping today, I, I have, I, I continue to be in these two different, uh, very different worlds. Uh, I still code, as, as, um, as Sandy said. Uh, I work with machine learning programs to help make uh, attorney document review a lot more efficient. Uh, but uh, my journey has been a challenging one. So before we go on the air and everything like that, I encourage you, you know, don't be afraid to go back to school. Uh, From my experience, how the hell can you make this efficient? What is it, a 11-page technological or academic paper becomes incredibly difficult if you're not familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, welcome to the world of the, of the law. Uh, and that's what we're gonna go over today. Uh, and I'll also say this before the network comes up. You know, today, you know, nothing I'm gonna talk about today is meant to insult anybody's intelligence. I'm gonna go in and kind of give you a perspective on what is the law. Uh, and I put that in quotes uh, when I'm going to talk about it because as Sandy was, was indicating, there's a real gap. And, and most of the time I, I spend my role uh, as that bridge to be communicating back and forth between two very different groups of uh, people. I'll say this since we are off the air. You know, if a lot of this stuff today you say, there's no way that could possibly be the way things are. Welcome to the world. That is the way. And as a community, we need to at least know that, have some insights into it, to be able to be uh, positive advocates and to understand uh, what needs to be done. So in our so. terminology, since this is off the record, we need to hack the system. We need to understand how it works so that we can manipulate it to get the results we need. Uh, that, that was commentary, if you didn't hear that, about hacking the system and uh, you know, maybe hacking the laws, uh, what we should talk about, and do that in a way that, uh, because really, I I'll tell you, if you've never seen the movie War Games or anything from 1983, uh, really, when you talk to politicians and talk to policy people and you talk to most attorneys, I'll tell you, go back and watch that movie, because uh, that really is much of pop, you know, people who are making decisions, uh, that is their, uh, oftentimes their perspective on what this community is about. Um, so, uh, just to be aware of that. Are we on the air now, or? Okay. okay. Does, I, I hesitate to do this, but uh, does anybody have any questions before we start or anything, or? Yes, yes. 
I certainly can. You're going to find that I'm not a person that likes to be caged. Is that better? Okay. You're, you're going to find that I'm not a person that likes to be caged behind the podium here, uh, even though there is a lot of security standing behind that. Uh, so, are there any other questions? Or question. Yes. The law review paper we're writing is the, 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 it publishes once a year. Yes. Is that the norm? Uh, typically, law reviews, what we're referring to with law reviews in the legal community. Oh, repeat the question. I, I'm sorry. Oh, the, the question was, the question was um, uh, do law reviews publish once a year? First of all, what is a law review? A law in the, um, first of all, the, when you get a law degree, you're actually getting what's called a professional degree. This is somewhat similar to a doctor, a physician gets a medical degree. A lawyer gets what's called a JD in the United States, a Juris Doctorate. Um, and, um, and the Juris Doctor of Process is a professional degree. In that professional academic realm, there are uh, high-level academic uh, publications uh, that are analogous to a lot of the publications in the technology field, the academic uh, technology field, uh, and those uh, publications are what law reviews are. So it's kind of the, where people discuss articles. And in answer to your question, uh, what, you know, do they publish once a year? Uh, typically, they publish twice a year, um, but uh, it's really quite a, uh, quite a, uh, 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 an honor to be selected uh, to be in a, a law review uh, article, uh, so you should be. Uh, I'm just feeling that it's an honor, it's onerous probably. It, it is onerous. I, I worked on law review, uh, when you're in law school, you can get selected for law review. I worked on law review, and it's probably one of the most miserable, uh, uh, Okay, we're on now? Great. Great. Okay, this is technology law. Uh, okay, there we go. This is technology uh, law, law issues for security professionals. Uh, we're going to talk about today a number of different issues uh, as we come up here. The presentation roadmap, there basically are going to be three different parts of the presentation. There's going to be an overview of what we mean by the law, and I put that in quotes uh, intentionally because the law may not be what you think it is, uh, and that is sometimes to your peril, and if you're working as an advocate or, or trying to inform other people or trying to communicate with people, it's very important to understand how the policymakers and attorneys and, and other people may view the law differently from uh, the community. Then I'm going to illustrate some of those concepts from what the law is with some uh, statutes, some federal statutes and some state statutes uh, that might be of particular interest uh, to this community. Um, when I present them, I don't mean to stereotype anything or uh, to uh, provide any, uh, you know, type in insights like that. It's simply to provide an overview of the laws. And then I'm going to get into something with changing times. Uh, originally, I was in policy research. Uh, for me, policy is very important. Uh, and changing times is going to give you some insights into what is changing. And uh, if you think things are challenging now, uh, unfortunately, and it's not my intent with this presentation to worry people or make them concerned, but uh, I think it is kind of a wake-up call to say that things are changing uh, and we might need to have a larger voice uh, in these community or in the, the broader community. Uh, today is a legal information session. Uh, as uh, prior to becoming an attorney, again, I went back to school after being uh, in the technology field, uh, or I've been programming now for 30 years, uh, and uh, I went back to school. Uh, you know, people used to talk about this. What's the difference between legal information and, uh, and legal advice? Legal advice is when you sit down with an attorney, you hire the attorney, and you get legal advice specific to your situation. Today, these are insights, more policy-type discussions on what the law is and how it might be applied in certain cases. Uh, knowing what you don't know, uh, you know, for me, the, the shock of going back to law school, one of the reasons why I went back to law school was to try to figure out what I didn't know. Uh, and as we discussed a, a couple of minutes ago, uh, the law really is, it's fascinating, it's interesting, but uh, knowing what you don't know is very important. A common thread throughout the presentation today is going to be this concept, uh, and this comes from uh, ancient Roman law. Uh, we have over 2,000 years of precedent for this. Uh, but ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, but, as we're going to find today, 
uh, you know, how realistic this is today. Uh, again, we're going to cover a lot of material, uh, but, uh, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse, but trying to figure out what the law is uh, right now, I will be the first one to admit, uh, is a real challenge. Uh, it's something that I think we have to work on and, and make sure that this community's voice is heard. Uh, you people probably know uh, more about many of these issues uh, than most of the people who are uh, developing laws and things of that sort. The first session uh, that we're going to talk about is, you know, this concept, what is the law? And we're going to dive right into this. Uh, what do we mean by the law? I'm going to cover a couple of different aspects of this. Uh, some of this may sound very basic, may, very introductory, but we need to have a good, firm foundation. One of the first distinctions when we talk about laws is knowing the difference between criminal law and civil law. And this is how an attorney or a lawyer, or attorney, lawyer, policymaker looks at things. Criminal laws are situations where the government is coming after you. And I'll use these terms specifically. Uh, the government is prosecuting you for some type of infraction of the law or a law. And if you are held guilty, uh, then the penalties that typically come with criminal, uh, this is when you start spending time as a guest of maybe a federal penitentiary or a state penitentiary. Uh, there can also be fines, there can be probation, um, and this has a uh, serious consequences, particularly if you get convicted of a felony uh, for people throughout the rest of your life, really. Uh, it's a major curtailment of, uh, of civil liberties uh, to be uh, convicted of a uh, felony. And the standard, um, when, when you're talking about being convicted and proven guilty, uh, typically you need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, that's a very, actually a fairly high standard. In contrast, we have civil law. Civil law are lawsuits. These are where two people sue e each other or one person sues another person. Uh, if you're held liable, uh, then what uh, typically comes out of that is you might be required to pay damages or you might have something called an injunction issue. Uh, against you. An injunction is essentially a command by the court uh, to do something or to not do something. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate all this stuff in a couple uh, of minutes here. This will start making sense why we need to have such precise definitions and need to understand these distinctions. The next slide is going to deal with this is something that really has become a problem, I think, in the United States. And I did this slide very specifically that we essentially have federal law and we have state law. Uh, they are, you need to know when you're looking or you're trying to figure out what the law is or you're talking to policymakers or to politicians or attorneys, you need to know if you're talking about federal law or state law. There's been kind of an erosion over the past 25 years and a mistake that sometimes people make that they think that federal law defines everything, that it's kind of the big law, you know, that's the big leagues, and then the state is just kind of the junior varsity uh, version of, of the law or something. That is not the case. Um, and as we'll uh, illustrate here, um, generally speaking, when you're talking about federal law and you're, you're talking about federal laws, you need to stay within that silo, so to speak, uh, within that realm, within that sphere of influence that court cases then interpret the federal law. They're, they're, you're in the federal sphere. Likewise, you're in the state sphere if there are state laws, et cetera. As I'm going to illustrate, and I think that this is increasingly becoming an issue, the state laws are, in, are starting to become, or there are a lot of state laws, I should say, on the books that people are not aware of. Many cases, um, and, and this is just out of necessity because there's so much of this stuff, in many cases there's, there's usually largely a community focus on federal law. Um, and, but what I want to emphasize is that there are many cases there are state laws uh, that are just as onerous and sometimes just as outdated and sometimes even more so uh, than the federal laws. The, uh, the next slide is really one of the core slides in it. And if you get anything out of this presentation, I hope that you uh, understand this concept. When most people say, well, I looked up the law, and, and again, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence here or anything, but somebody says, well, I looked up the law. What people are generally referring to is, is that they looked up the statute. Uh, and if you see that on the slide there, that is one of the clouds uh, that is in there. Statutes are, are laws that are passed, they're written down. Oh, I am? Sorry. Apologize about that. Uh, we'll get a slide ahead the next, uh, uh, the next uh, source here. 
Uh, but what we're talking about here is generally statutes. Statutes are passed by legislatures. You have federal statutes. You have state statutes. Uh, again, you need to stay within, generally speaking, you need to stay within those silos to understand how that law is actually interpreted. If you see here, the law is in the middle of this. So when you look up a statute, a statute is passed by a legislative body in the federal government, that would be by Congress, in state governments, that's generally by a state legislature. Uh, the statutes are what most people think of. These are very easy to find. There are some great resources online that uh, talk about statutes, but as I'm going to illustrate in a couple of minutes, just looking at the statutes does not mean that you're understanding the law. So if you're talking to policymakers and things, uh, there's a lot more that goes into it. And some of those other areas are international treaties. We're going to see an example of that today. Uh, the the controversy, still controversial, our uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, when you're talking about that and people say, well, that act isn't a good idea, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is actually the United States' federal statutes uh, that implement an international treaty. So when you're talking to policymakers about what's wrong with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you're not just looking at the text of that act, you also need to be looking at international law issues, uh, commitments, treaties, and things of that sort. Um, so there's a much broader perspective when you're looking at the law. Constitutions. This is not a typo. Uh, when most people talk about their constitutional rights, they talk about their First Amendment rights and their Second Amendment rights and Fourth Amendment rights and things like that. Those are typically referring to your federal constitutional rights. But if you've never looked it up, every state in the United States has its own state constitution. And if you remember back to the uh, graphic that I have where you have a federal sphere and a state sphere, um, people sometimes think the federal is, is, is bigger than or, or uh, in some cases always supreme to uh, state law. But what most people would be shocked to find out is, is that those federal definition of rights uh, in the Constitution are actually the minimums. Uh, and that might shock a lot of people. Uh, the state can actually, for state law issues, can actually provide much, uh, uh, much broader uh, protections, and indeed many states do do that uh, in their constitutions. But we'll see an example uh, today where the constitutions also inform on what the interpretation of the law is as well. Regulations, I could go on about this all day. Uh, what regulations are essentially in the United States um, there is a principle that legislative bodies can delegate some of their lawmaking authority to administrative agencies. You might know them more familiarly, uh, familiar, anyway, to use familiar terms for them. Uh, you might be talking about things like the IRS, the uh, EPA, the FCC, the FAA. Those organizations promulgate what are called rules or regulations, and these really trip people up. Uh, because if people look up the law uh, and they're looking just at the statute, actually those statutes provide the overall structure for a body of law, but the regulations are very important. And as a community, uh, the, the regulations are usually where you have a direct input during the rulemaking process, uh, during the uh, development of these things, particularly for organizations like the FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the SEC, uh, and increasingly uh, HHS, which is uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, I just mentioned that because these regulations are a big deal. Um, they uh, really, uh, when you look at the law, if you put it into books and things like that, uh, the stack of books that represents the statutes might fit on this table. The regulations would probably fill this room. Uh, they're a huge area in the United States and people need to understand that system in order to inform on um, what's going on. The other one I want to talk about here is the common law. Uh, the best description I can give, give of this is, is that the common law sets as kind of a backdrop or a penumbra or a uh, set of common templates and common understandings. Uh, if you have a programming background, these are kind of like abstract classes or something like that, and the statutes actually implement, or uh, you can use interfaces as well, but actually implement uh, those laws and the, the uh, understandings. Now, you may say the common law comes, the United States is a common law country. What that means is, is that the law evolves over time. And um, it comes from a British tradition uh, that sometimes the law is not always written down in the way we think of uh, the law being written down. These uh, common law principles stand as a backdrop 
uh, to a lot of law, and one that we're going to be illustrated today uh, is the concept of trespass. Trespass is a common law concept. Essentially, it's the non-criminal invasion of the property interest of another. If you think about that abstractly, uh, you can see how that would probably apply to what are called in popular culture uh, computer crimes codes. <clears throat> but uh, the, uh, the final uh, thing that I want to talk about here uh, is going to be court cases. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about court cases. Again, the United States is a common law country. One of the ways that we develop law in this country is through court cases. And the best, the best way I can describe this, if you think about all this other stuff, the statutes, the regulations, the constitutions, all that kind of stuff, uh, you can think about that as being um, uh, the rules. You know, if you're playing chess or you're playing a sport or, or whatever, those define the rules. When the rules actually get implemented, but that doesn't mean you know how to play chess. That doesn't mean that you're a good chess player. Court cases are somewhat analogous to that that court cases are where the rubber hits the road. This is where courts are actually interpreting not only what the law is, but they're applying it to specific facts in the case. And that's why court cases are so important. There are a number of, you see these in the news all the time. Um, it's because they're very, very important within the United States system to understand how the law um, uh, actually develops over time and how courts are applying that law to specific uh, circumstances. Now. In order to understand those court cases, and I know this might be long and, and things like that, but you need to understand this stuff to be able to start to talk to policymakers and things, because if you just go in talking about the statutes, they're going to look at you and say, what about all this other stuff? And court cases are, are one that uh, has a profound effect in the United States, and you need to understand with court cases that not all court decisions are the same. Uh, and this is something, even though these are frequently in the news, I'm hoping that you have a little bit more sophisticated understanding of what those cases in the news mean, when they're important, and when those cases start becoming the law, uh, and the law on a specific uh, issue. But all courts are not the same. Uh, they issue uh, different levels of opinion, and this is because of a, uh, a fundamental distinction uh, in the United States, we essentially have trial courts and appellate courts. A trial court is what we typically think of. This is what you might see on television. This is where you have a jury. This is supposedly where you have lawyers up there arguing before the jury and pounding on the podium, which really doesn't happen. And I would caution you if you're ever in court not to do that uh, because that is not real life. Uh, but uh, the, the trial court opinions are essentially binding the parties to that situation. Uh, so if uh, a person is accused of a crime, uh, there could be a court case, the person may go to court, uh, they may appear before a jury, and there might be a decision re rendered. The important point to understand about a trial court decision is, generally speaking, they bind the parties, not necessarily other people. Now, I'll get to why that's important, because an appellate court is very, very different. An appellate court is essentially a trial court decision can be appealed under certain circumstances. Again, this isn't television or movies or anything like that. This is what really happens. Under certain circumstances, a trial court opinion can be appealed. And those circumstances, and this is a nugget I really want you to understand, is essentially that the trial court committed an error of law. So we had that slide there with all those things, statutes and regulations and all those types of things. Courts, when they're applying the law to a specific set of facts and circumstances in a case, can get it wrong sometimes. Uh, and if they get it wrong, uh, you can appeal that case to an appellate court. Now, when an appellate court takes a look, or I should stop here for a second, you know, just because you didn't like the decision is not grounds for appealing a case. That might be part of it sometimes, uh, but that in itself is not grounds to appeal a case. Um, Although, you know, if, if we allowed that, you know, about half of all people are going to be appealing uh, the decision because typically uh, somebody is losing uh, in court uh, half the time. But these appellate court decisions uh, can bind the lower courts uh, that are within the jurisdiction of the appellate court. So what happens is, is that a case starts out in trial court. There are, there's some decision that's made that could be by a jury or by a judge. If the judge or the court made an error of law, 
there might be what's called an appeal to an appellate court. That appellate court then looks at that error of law. They don't rehear the case. You, you're not pounding podiums and having juries or anything like that in an appellate court. Uh, I went over to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's an example of an appellate court. You know, it's a very sedate uh, type environment, um, and people are arguing what the law should be. So that graphic that I had before with regulations and statutes and, and constitutions and stuff like that, when you're in appellate court, you're essentially arguing what the law should be, how all those pieces should be fitting together. And I'm going to give an example of this uh, because this comes up all the time. In the, again, we're in the federal courts realm uh, here. In the federal courts, there are 94 district courts. They are federal trial courts. This is where, you know, if you're accused of a crime or there's a federal lawsuit filed for you, this is where you start out uh, in, in the trial courts. Then if you, um, you appeal the case, you go to one of, there are 12, they're called circuit courts at the federal level, but these are the mid-level appellate courts. And I want you to see, hopefully it's up there, uh, I want you to see the geographic distribution here because this is absolutely essential when you're understanding what the law is and it brings a lot of things together. First of all, as most people uh, are shocked to find out, federal law, even though supposedly it you know, uh, covers the entire United States, can actually vary from geographic location to geographic location on this map, depending on if the court who issued the opinion, which geographic location they're in. So there are 11 geographic locations. There's a 12th uh, circuit court as well. But what this means is, is that when you read in the news that the federal uh, ninth circuit, which is the mid-level appellate court, held such and such, made such and such a decision, that decision might be binding the lower district courts within the geographic distribution, and the Ninth Circuit happens to be on the West Coast. But somebody that lives in the Third Circuit, where I live, I live in Pennsylvania, uh, I live in the Third Circuit, that is not necessarily depend or, uh, or binding upon me in the Third Circuit. And that's very interesting. This is why when you hear in the news sometimes that the Supreme Court heard a case to resolve a split among the circuits, well, when you talk about a split among the circuits, this is what we're talking about. In a couple minutes, I'll show you why this is so critical, because when you're tasked with, you need to know what the law is, uh, it might be surprising to find out, even at the federal law, that what the law is might vary according to court cases, depending on your geographic area. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest federal appellate court. Uh, it makes final decisions on federal issues. Uh, this is something else that people get confused. Uh, state court systems look very, very much like this as well. Generally, they have a trial court level, some type of mid-level appellate court, and then a final state court. But on state court matters, like contract, uh, family law issues typically, uh, wills, you know, what happens when you die and things, the state court might actually, the state highest court might actually be the final arbiter of those issues. So it's not always the case that the Supreme Court you know, comes in and, you know, uh, puts their foot down and has the final authority on all law. And that surprises a lot of people. It's something I didn't understand prior to going back to law school. Uh, but this uh, graphic here illustrates that uh, kind of silos approach. You have the first, second, third, uh, up to the 11th Circuit. And essentially what this illustrates is, is that those mid-level circuit courts bind all the lower district courts, which are the trial courts, uh, in the federal system within their own jurisdiction. Uh, the, uh, the next slide, and I'll, I'll make these slides obviously available to you then, you know, the point here is, is that when you're interpreting things, you're talking to policymakers, you're reading about uh, stories and things like that, this is all what goes into the law. Uh, and as we started out the presentation saying that this is probably a lot more complicated than it might appear at first, maybe it's more complicated than it should be. I don't know. I'm not. Uh, here to discuss that uh, today, but uh, when you're doing this, it, it requires a much more sophisticated approach than it might appear. Uh, initially, there are issues geographically. Where are you located? Are you within the state or the federal system? Was the court issuing the opinion a trial court or appellate court? Uh, you know, is it civil, criminal, etc.? cetera? Uh, I wanted to give one example of how this comes out very, very quickly. These are two actual headlines Hopefully everybody can see them. Two actual headlines that came out last month. 
uh, and they came out within 10 days of each other, and this illustrates this, this concept. In one case, uh, NSA foam program, probably unconstitutional, judge rules. Okay, uh, 10 days later, U.S. judge says NSA phone surveillance is lawful. Well, what is it? What is the law? The honest answer is we don't know. And why? Going through the parsing, this was a federal law. These were decisions by district courts, federal district courts. That means they're at the trial court level. That means they're probably not precedential. They probably don't have binding authority outside. So the fact of the matter is, is that we don't know yet. Uh, well, we might have, uh, I think everybody in here probably has an opinion on this uh, particular topic, but uh, you know, as far as the courts go, we don't have a final uh, decision uh, on what the, what the law is uh, related to that specific issue. Now I'm going to uh, switch gears. That gives you enough, that, that's basically law, part of law school first year condensed into about 15 minutes right there. So if you're sitting there overwhelmed with this, and again, I'm not trying to insult anybody by saying that, but I mean, if you're sitting there saying, oh my goodness, you know, I never knew this, you know, welcome to that world. Uh, and I think if you brought a lot of lawyers into this room and they followed the presentations that are gonna go on, they would probably be saying the exact same thing. Oh my goodness, I didn't even know what I didn't know uh, with these situations. Um, now I'm gonna shift gears. I'm gonna talk about some actual federal statutes uh, within our construction there, are some actual federal statutes, uh, and illustrate some of these concepts and show how what you might look at in a statute might not be what the law is uh, in a specific case. And the first one that I'm going to cover uh, is going to be the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, most people are probably familiar uh, with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, there's been a lot of activity with this uh, lately. Uh, from a popular culture view, uh, and people that you might be addressing and, and policymakers and things. This is essential, the federal anti-hacking uh, statute. And again, that's a popular culture uh, view of what that term uh, means. But essentially, and distilling this down, um, and I'll preface these comments by saying, you really need to figure out what the whole law is with this situation. I'm just gonna use part of this uh, particular statute to illustrate, illustrate some of the issues and things that go into figuring out what the law is. But in, in its nucleus, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act pro, uh, prohibits two things. It prohibits accessing a computer without authorization and uh, exceeding authorized access to essentially a protected computer. Uh, that's something that may sound, hmm, what, what does that mean? Uh, this has been fodder for many, many, many court cases uh, that illustrate what these principles are. Uh, serious consequences, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is a federal statute. Uh, it has both uh, criminal aspects to it and it has civil aspects to it. And I'm gonna really emphasize those civil aspects because I think that they are on the rise. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of the talk as well. One thing I wanna uh, just mention here, if you go and you read the statute itself, it essentially prohibits unauthorized access and exceeding authorized access uh, to protected computers. You might read the statute and say, boy, what's a protected computer? The statute defines a protected computer. It essentially says that it's a computer that's engaged in commerce. Uh, you might look at that and say, oh, phew, you know, that doesn't apply to me. You know, I, I'm just doing this, you know, nobody's paying me for this. Uh, this is just uh, something that I'm doing. There's no compensation or I'm doing for a nonprofit. That is not what that means. Uh, what engaged in commerce means is, and this is pulling in from that slide that I have with all the bubbles around it, is constitutional interpretation. The way the federal constitution is interpreted, uh, there's a commerce clause in the United States Constitution, and the way the federal courts have interpreted that commerce clause, almost any computer today, or computing device today, fits into this definition. But people might look at that statute and say, oh, okay, you know, this doesn't apply to me because I'm not selling anything, or I'm not, but that's not what that means. And I, I point this out and spend some time on this because these are the things that can trip up people uh, when they're discussing these issues, particularly with uh, policymakers. Now, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the, what we might call the unauthorized access prong. This is fairly straightforward uh, at this point. Um, most courts, interpret this uh, in the way that you would typically think about, that people access the computer or a computing device uh, without permission. 
the question comes in, and the interesting part for this crowd, I think, is the whole exceeding authorized access. And this will shock a lot of people, and I hope, you know, in part that this shocks you, uh, to see how the term exceeding authorized access is being interpreted by the courts and how it is representing the law. Um, typically what happens is in most places in the country, if you remember back to the graphic with the United States uh, and all the uh, appellate courts represented on that, in most of the country, in most of the circuits, the appellate courts have defined exceeding authorized access extremely broadly violating employer terms of, uh, you know, vi uh, violating uh, employer rules might trigger Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, prosecution, either a federal case or uh, civil cases. Uh, you know, violating uh, website terms of service, violating some type of contractual provisions and things like that. The point that I'm trying to make here is that in, in a large part of the United States, the law is interpreted extremely broadly. Anything that essentially goes beyond what you specifically are permitted to do could trigger, uh, in certain cases, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act issues, except if you're in the West Coast. And in the West Coast, there was a famous case, the Nosal case, where in the Ninth Circuit on the West Coast, uh, the federal rule, the, the Ninth Circuit looked at this situation and took a step back from it and said, well, what was the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act originally enacted to do? It was the, again, this is popular culture view, the anti-hacking statute, and we're not going to apply this in cases where somebody just violates their employee manual or their employee rules and trigger criminal prosecution for, for people. But it's important to understand that there are different uh, uh, applications to this and where you live in the United States, even though this is a federal statute, could differ in how the application of this law uh, comes out in your specific circumstances. Now, one of the other things I want to emphasize here is that sometimes people think, oh, federal law, that's the big leagues. You really have to do something bad, uh, you know, to have the feds come after you. Um, you know, as these cases illustrate, uh, that is not the case. Uh, there was a recent video, po uh, video poker machines. Apparently there was a firmware bug. Uh, the bug could be exploited with a couple of different button presses, which uh, paid out a lot more money than the casino or the, uh, you know, the video poker machine maker wanted uh, people to get, ended up with a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act prosecution for just doing a couple of different uh, button presses. Uh, many of you, and I'm sure there are many of you in the room that might be much more familiar with the the uh, Arnheimer case. Uh, I just want to talk about this a, a little bit, but here you had a security flaw uh, in the AT&T servers uh, related to the iPads, um, you know, attempts to notify about the security uh, issue and things like that. This was a fairly complex case. It's, it's on appeal right now uh, because of an error, supposedly an error of law issue. Um, but the outcome of this was for doing that, and this is one of the reasons why this is such a controversial uh, situation and why it should be followed. Uh, the, the outcome of that was 41 months in federal uh, prison plus $73,000 in restitution. Uh, again, when you're convicted of a felony, you're not going to probably have a high profile job uh, after you've served your time. So trying to pay back $73,000 in restitution um, is going to be a challenge. Uh, the U.S. versus Rosal case, this is another very recent case. Uh, this was uh, a person, a one-minute denial of service attack, uh, ended up with two years of re uh, probation, uh, federal probation and uh, restitution. And all of you, I am sure, are aware of the Aaron Schwartz case. I'm not minimizing it by not talking about it, but the point here is, is that the threshold uh, for the federal level, and this is a policy issue, that as you're discussing these types of things to inform um, uh, policymakers and attorneys and things of that sort of this type of situation uh, to let people know, you know, how this is uh, affecting uh, not only this community but also affects the broader community as well. That if people can't uh, reveal bugs or, or other types of uh, problems uh, that you discover while you're doing your security work, uh, you know, what the implications of that are for the broader uh, community. Uh, the rise of civil lawsuits. This I want to talk about a little bit because I think that this is something, this is really a, an increasing area and I think is going to be a hot area of law. Uh, the civil lawsuits really are cases where 
people are latching, or companies at this point, are latching on to this broad definition of what it means to uh, exceed authorized access, and they're applying it in ways that probably, uh, probably would not have um, uh, been done uh, even a couple of years ago. The three taps case here with the uh, Craigslist case, uh, this is somebody, uh, three taps was accused by Craigslist of doing uh, uh, data scraping from the Craigslist website. It was in violation of the Craigslist terms of service. Uh, and this ended up with a civil lawsuit. And the outcome of this was an injunction to prevent three taps uh, from uh, doing this type of thing. But there have been several cases of this sort where civil cases are increasingly becoming uh, an issue in a venue. And you may say, well, what does that have to do with us? Uh, you know, the, what I'm trying to get across here is that we're seeing a change uh, and, and there's an increasing sophistication. This civil uh, lawsuit uh, 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 venue or, or application was not the case uh, even a couple of years ago. So this is something that can run afoul if you do professionally um, a, a lot of uh, computer security work. Uh, this might affect your contracts. Uh, it might affect work that you do in the future where you might get sued, not by the government, the government's not coming after you, but by potential people that have been affected by, for example, a data breach or, or uh, some type of issue where uh, people think that they are, uh, they are uh, being held liable for something that they really aren't. Uh, just in the interest of time here, I'm going to skip the, the ECPA uh, uh, discussion because this is actually very, very similar. Um, to the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, the, the, let me just uh, go forward here. And these slides will be online here as well. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, highly controversial. Essentially what the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is, it's a federal law that prohibits, in part, uh, circumvention of technologies that protect copyrighted materials. The point that I want to make here with this, and from a policy issue, uh, as we're seeing other cases come in, a lot of people look at uh, or can look up the statute for the Computer Fraud and, or for the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. When they look up that act, they might say, oh, wow, there are a whole bunch of exceptions in there. You can't circumvent uh, that uh, technology unless you're working in security research or you're working in encryption or you're working uh, in interoperability. What I want to uh, note here, however, is, and this is you know, how to read uh, statutes, there is actually an exception uh, to the exceptions. Uh, if you go to law school, that'll become the norm uh, for you, but there's an exception to the exception that you need to comply with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act exceptions to apply. So all that uh, information that I was giving you about uh, how authorized access and exceeding authorized access now may become an issue, and now you may start having contractual uh, issues or violating terms of service or uh, some type of, of protections to APIs or things of that sort might uh, start becoming an issue for Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, one other, I want to shift gears here and talk about state cases uh, a little bit and then hopefully have some time for some questions here. Uh, state law, and, and unfortunately this presentation is a perfect example of that, sometimes gets short shrift. Uh, you know, people sometimes uh, really uh, don't understand that state law is as important as it, as it is. And what you're going to find is everything that I talked about so far was actually federal law uh, issues. But states can enact, uh, and almost every state has, what they call a computer crimes code. Uh, most people don't know that this is available, and as I'll cover at the end of the presentation, I'll say why it's important that you understand that it is available. But the, many of the state laws, if you read the state statutes, sound almost exactly like the federal statutes. In Pennsylvania, for example, if you read the, uh, the Pennsylvania uh, Computer Crimes Code, you're going to find it sounds eerily similar to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, but, and here's the point, and here's why I did that illustration at the beginning, you need to know which realm you're actually in, because even though the language may sound the same, it is up to the state courts to interpret it for state court issues. Uh, and that's something that can trip people up, because you might have language that sounds very, very similar. You might say, well, I'm complying with the federal rules, uh, but that might not be the rule for within your state, because the state courts themselves 
have authority to interpret their own state statutes, even though they may sound exactly the same. And it's just something to uh, be aware of. I'm not going to go through a whole lot of the uh, Pennsylvania issues, but I, I simply want to say that uh, Pennsylvania has, uh, and, and most of the states have this as well, have a very, very well-developed law uh, in civil or, or in uh, it related to uh, technology issues. What I want to get here is actually to the end of the uh, presentation, um, and, and that is what's changing, because I think this is very, very important for policy issues. There are a couple things changing. We've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, some things about what is the law, some applications of the statutes, and, and uh, things of that sort at both the federal and the state level. Uh, what's changing? Number one, you're, most states now have what's called a uh, Data Breach Reporting Act. Uh, and a data breach reporting act uh, is really a double-edged sword because what these acts typically do is they may require mandatory reporting of data breach issues and some of the other issues that we talked about. So whereas five years ago or ten years ago, it might have been in a company's interest to say, boy, you know what, we had that data breach, but it's probably not a good idea to tell a whole lot of people about that because it's going to be bad for business. That is changing. Uh, and these data breach reporting acts are heightening the requirements and are increasingly the companies themselves can be held liable for not reporting these issues. Now for some of you that might be giving you work because there's an increased uh, knowledge of, of the need for good security issues and good security measures, but the point here is, is that whereas things might have been discretionary even five years ago, they're increasingly becoming mandatory. Another big area are regulations, and this has been a fundamental change really within the past two years that a number, and this is happening at both the state and the federal level, but at the federal level, there have been significant changes in the regulations that apply, for example, to personal health care information. Uh, the SEC has increased their penalties and things for not reporting issues relating to banking. Uh, the FTC is, is increasing their regulations as well. And remember, regulations are the law, uh, and there are stiff, stiff, stiff penalties. Again, there's now an incentive for companies or to actually be reporting these issues, being aware of these issues, and heightening and increasing the, the uh, threshold uh, for what's going to happen if they don't report uh, these particular issues. Uh, along with that, you start having insurance companies. I'm not going to go into a whole discussion of insurance companies, but insurance companies are starting to offer uh, data breach, for example, uh, uh, coverage. Uh, so once you get insurance companies uh, involved, not bad-mouthing them if anybody, uh, uh, deals with them, but you're going to have insurance companies are increasingly trying to shift the risk, and they're going to start using those civil uh, it, uh, lawsuits that I was talking about in order to try to get compensation um, from people, for example, for data breach, uh, data breaches. And one final one are stockholders. Uh, if it, this isn't bad enough and the message isn't clear enough to what's changing, uh, particularly at companies, the stockholders are increasingly holding the officers of the companies uh, responsible for data breaches and not taking proper precautionary and uh, preventive measures ahead of time in order to prevent data breaches. So when you have 40 million or 70 million records uh, that are uh, compromised uh, and that affects the bottom line, you know, a billion dollar, whatever it is, uh, shareholders are increasingly holding the, the, uh, the, uh, the owners of the company uh, responsible for those acts. So you have a lot of things changing uh, in law uh, that uh, really are going to make a, a big difference. That was a lot of stuff today. Sorry we got a little bit of a late start there. Uh, I'm going to be around for the rest of the weekend. I've been here, enjoyed it. This is my first Schmookon and uh, I've had a great time. Can't wait for some of the presentations this afternoon. What I'm hoping that you started getting out of this is, is that you're not going to walk out of here lawyers. I encourage you not to do that. If, if you need help or whatever, seek help um, because these things might be a lot more complicated uh, than they see, seem to begin with. You know, support advocacy groups that are working in these areas. There are some here. The EFF is here, but there are other organizations that are trying to give a voice uh, to the community on this, these issues so that people understand that there's more than one side. Uh, to this. And one other thing I'll encourage you to do, you know, work in policy areas uh, and vote uh, and uh, run for office. It may sound odd to say that. Some people might be reluctant to do so, but uh, that's one way uh, 
that is very effective to change the law to become the people who help make the law. So thank you.